So uh, I'm really uh, happy to introduce Mike, who I work with here at Boku. Uh, he had an awesome blog, uh, a series of blog posts on, on Boku's blog about uh, stress testing node in production, uh, real-time uh, node applications. Um, and uh, so now he's going to give an awesome talk about it. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome Mike.
to um, to track where electoral college votes were going and who was in the lead for the presidential election. And what they're interested in doing was using that live uh, on the air, as you just saw, but also making that uh, real-time application so that uh, other people that were connected to it at home watching um, would get updates as they were made on television. And so this is what uh, is being called a second screen application. And that's going to be, that's like a, a buzzword that's, that's kind of gaining popularity. Has anyone heard of second screen before? Some people do. Yeah, yeah. So a lot, so this is something, like, a, this is like a, a medium that a lot of television producers are exploring as far as like trying to get more engagement for their viewers and, and connecting um, you with an application that kind of helps your uh, broadcast content. And so this is a little bit of video of me just demoing it. I have two different browser windows open and I'm kind of, I'm kind of just proof of concept. I'm like, okay, this is what happens in one browser and you can see it's being pushed out to the other browser. And for uh, the purpose of like running a stress test, this, this um, paradigm is, is very, very simplistic, uh, which is thankful because there's a lot, there's a lot of variables going on when you have to do any sort of stress test. And, but this is probably the most simplistic model that you could build where you have one broadcaster that's in charge of all the data and just pushes it out to everyone else. So none of the people that are watching on television are, <coughs> are communicating with each other. It's just being published in one direction. So um, lucky for me, that made simulating this stuff uh, a lot easier than it would be if you know I was doing something like a multiplayer game where there's a lot of different rooms and all the players are interacting with each other. This is just kind of just published out one way. So we'll start with um, what it looks like to, to build that application, uh, or to build an application, hopefully, you know, in a generalizable way. The first thing is um, um, the importance of modularization. So I mean, this is like kind of a watchword of programming everywhere, but uh, as it relates to this talk tonight, the most important part of modularization is that you're able to um, get your networking logic outside in uh, the rest of your, your program so that it is uh, it is kind of isolated and it's something that you can work with so that you know like I have this one file or this one module we'll say that um, is concerned with making connections and communicating between the server and the other clients. Um, and that doesn't have to worry about like working with the DOM or doing anything else that's related to your application. Uh, we'll get into why this is important in a bit but uh, it's more than it's more than just the general like best practices and maintainability things that I, I'm sure you're used to hearing when it comes to modularization. Now it seems like a lot of you are I mean, most of you know what socket IO is, so I don't have to spend too much time on this. But um, basically, the socket IO is a project that's um, developed by a company called LearnBoost, and what it's primarily concerned with is uh, bring real time to the, the browser environment into many, many different browser environments. So um, if you're just targeting Chrome, it's easy. You can just use WebSockets. But because a lot of people live in the real world and uh, they have to target other browsers, Socket.io is kind of a compatibility layer that's able to use other transport mechanisms that are uh, um, available in browsers as old as IE6. Um, and then as at a high level, from as a user of this library, you don't have to worry about those distinctions. You're still using the same API and you don't care however, whatever transform mechanism is using. So sometimes it's called the, the jQuery of real-time application because people appreciate its API in the same way they appreciate the jQuery. Um, and an important distinction to make when you're talking about Socket.io is that it's actually comprised of two components. There's Socket.io client and Socket.io uh, nothing, Socket.io proper. So Socket.io client is the thing that actually runs in the browser and it's the thing that's aware of. Uh, it's able to do feature detection and see which transport browsers <coughs> people are doing. And then Socket.io is the part that runs in Node.js and runs in the server. And then um, in addition to just serving the client, it actually serves, it, it can, if you want, serve the static JavaScript assets to the different browsers. It also is in charge of you know, communicating with them over um, a specific, uh, over a dedicated protocol that they've implemented for this. And so, um, if you, yeah, so if you look at the Socket.io project, you see that it, it requires a Socket.io client as a dependency. So, uh, if 
you're, you're not only going to be looking at the source of socket I.O., it's helpful to know um, that distinction and how these two things fit together. So, um, another, uh, one thing that I would recommend doing is parameterizing your uh, endpoint in your, in your client application budget. So here, what I've done is um, I've kind of stripped out all the other parts of this, this application, and this is just the part, this is the, the JavaScript file that's intended for the, the browser. And um, even though I knew where our, uh, where PBS's application was going to live, we ended up getting a Rackspace server, and I knew the IP address, and I knew the port it was running on. Um, I also knew that I'd be testing in a lot of different ways, and I think that generally, um, that's not always going to be the case, so if I were to develop another application, I might not know in advance where I'm going to go, and it might even be that I buy a month of uh, a couple hours of service with a bunch of different providers, and then I can benchmark the providers themselves in addition to the application. And so, for those reasons, it makes a lot of sense to uh, generalize your source code such that um, the endpoint location is a uh, parameter that you can kind of build. And the way that I, I did this was using grunt.js. And so this is kind of part of my grunt file all mashed together. Who here has heard of grunt.js? Okay, cool. Um, so grunt.js, for those of you who didn't raise your, raise your hand, grunt.js is a, a JavaScript build tool. Um, and so it's, it's like if you've heard of a make file, or a, if you've heard of make, then it's, it's sort of like make, but intended specifically for JavaScript projects. And it's written in Node.js so that when you use it, you use JavaScript. So these are the directives for my, these are part of the directives for my project and the relevant ones to this. And so you'll see that this is part of the copy task. And um, just a caveat here is that um, at the time I was developing for Run 03, and since then, Grunt 04 has come out, and a lot of things have changed. So, I'm not, I don't think that this specific uh, syntax will work anymore. But the general use case, though, is that um, when I was copying files into place, because I was uh, doing some transformation on these files, I was making a replacement, uh, and you can see the, the, the work is going on here, where I'm replacing node hooks and node port with the relevant parts of the config, um, and then. It's also a good idea like to uh, derive these from the environment so that you can so the other developers can change it. So if I'm if I'm another guy on your team and I, I run um, several project on four eight thousand, then I don't want to then it's gonna be annoying for me to have to like shut that down or to actually change the source code. So um, doing something like this is nice because it lets that concern be managed on an environment basis. Um, and then if people don't want to bother with it, it'll just it'll, it'll fall back on details. So um, yeah, you can opt in to changing wherever you actually have this thing. <coughs> so you would run you would run your grunt uh, task, or yeah, so you run your grunt task, and it would output files where these strings are now transformed in, in, into the relevant uh, locations. And so one thing I could have done here too, um, just to point this out, is since this is all just uh, this, this, when I'm building this, all it sees is a big file. It just sees text content. It doesn't care that it's actually JavaScript. So um, port is a number, and I wouldn't actually necessarily have to enclose that in strings and quotes. Uh, I could have, I could have just, I could have omitted that and just put this. The only problem then, though, is that it's no longer valid JavaScript, and uh, so I can't lint it anymore. And also, I can't write tests against it. And what's important about this is that, like most of your tests shouldn't depend, like this should be, this, as it is now though, your test should run fine, because your test shouldn't depend on the server being a valid server, because um, unless you're doing integration tests, which is, you know, a higher level and you have different concerns, then for like your unit tests, there's not going to be any network communication anyway. So it's alright to test your code that has these dummy strings in it, because it's not actually going to be trying to connect um, in any other case. So, um, so uh, FS, or the File System API in Node, for most of those operations, you have two different uh, function calls you can make for any kind of uh, task you want to do. So if you want to uh, read file, or, or um, read directory, or stack something, then you can, either, you can either do it synchronously, or you can do it asynchronously. Um, and so if you've been developing a node, with Node for any amount of time, you've probably learned 
that it's a bad practice for using the synchronous version of any of these methods. And that's mostly true. But something that I, I don't see talked about too much, and maybe that's just because it's really basic, or um, probably because it's really basic, but uh, I'm saying it anyway, is that uh, for initialization, it's, it's much, much easier to use sync. Um, and for initialization, you don't have the same concern to do uh, for when you're actually running your server uh, or when you're actually responding to requests. So in case you're not aware, like the reason why sync is so frowned upon most of the time or synchronous operation is because it's going to block the thread of execution. So if you're reading a file for every, if you're hosting a single web service and you're reading an HTML file whenever someone asks for it, and if you use the sync API, the synchronous API, then um, a request is going to come in and then the process is going to hold off on processing any, anything else. Uh, go fetch that HTML document, read it, and then spit it back out to the client. So over that whole time, it could have been doing other useful tasks, but it's not able to. And so that's really a problem, and it really goes against uh, Node.js's like an evented nature, and that's why people advocate against it. And so instead, if you do it asynchronously, then you can kind of tell the process, hey, tell the operating system to do that stuff, and while it's doing that stuff, you know, do handle any other requests or company, or do whatever you want, because that's going to take a little bit of time. And then when it's done, you'll give um, the asynchronous method a callback that it will then execute. So it can kind of, while the operating system is doing lower level stuff that takes a relatively longer amount of time, then um, the execution thread is blocking and the process can still handle stuff. The only problem with doing that is that it's kind of awkward because you have to these, uh, as you know, like working with asynchronous methods, uh, working with callbacks, things can kind of get messy sometimes. Um, it's not as straightforward as just using synchronous methods. And so that's why I think that during initialization of your application, where you're not trying to optimize for serving people, you're just trying to optimize for you know, getting up and running, it makes a lot of sense to use the synchronous methods um, because you're only doing them once at initialization time. And so you're not really as concerned with any overhead you might incur from reading the file, reading like a config file, for instance, instead of this HTML document you keep rereading. Okay. Um, so I mentioned before that when you're working with socket IO, you're probably going to be looking at the source. Uh, and that's because the examples on the website, for instance, they have examples, but they happen to be somewhat high level. So um, these are these are really good to get you started and to give you an idea of the kinds of things that are that you're capable of doing with Socket IO. But for the most part, um, they're a little bit high level. If you want to do something uh, kind of custom, then you have to dive into um, a lower level of the API. And so there is a, there is a wiki available, but it's I, I I found it to be a little bit incomplete. Um, so you can see it's, it's kind of short and there's, and there's frequently asked questions. But um, what I found to be like, the best way to get information on this was actually looking at the source. And thankfully, it, the source documents the public API. So that's one thing I think you have to be really careful of whenever you start looking at a project source code for answers for how to get things done, is knowing what is likely to change. Uh, and so you're able to avoid you know, private methods or things that develop <coughs> the next version or the next uh, release. So if we look at the source now, let's see. Yeah. So you can see here that this is decorated. Or maybe you can't see it's extremely late, but yeah. So this uh, method is decorated as private, um, as is this, this connect method. So most of these things that we're looking at here are decorated as private. But you can see that, well, at the very least, they are uh, annotating all their method things with this, this consistent commenting style. And so that's really useful to you because that lets you know, like, okay, like, I see how I can technically get this done, but if I do, like, you're kind of, you know what you're getting yourself into. Um, and so that way you're able to, as you're, learning, as you're learning the API and as you're learning how the internals work, you're also learning more advanced ways that are acceptable to do things and more advanced ways that are a little bit risky to do things. So um, 
uh, one, one example specific to socket IO is working with dynamic connections. So here I have an approach where like, um, we have a reference to the socket server, so this is, um, and then from within that we have a reference to um, any sockets that come in. We're saying that whenever a socket comes in, we, if sometimes if the application is live, we might want to do one thing, and then if, if the application is offline, we know we'll do another. This was of particular interest to me because we were running this server, um, you know, all the time, but we only wanted to actually go through all the rigmarole of connecting people and, and having their sockets initiate if the television broadcast was on air. So um, initially, I, I coded up something like this, and I was hoping that, like, you know, I could do something like maybe like jQuery, where later when I decided that the um, the application wasn't live anymore. I could do socket server dot sockets dot off connection, and I could unbind it, and I could unbind it later. But um, as it stands, you can't do that. Uh, you can only bind things on here once. Uh, so instead, like this is the kind of logic that I had initially, where I just had like one connection handler for my application, and it was aware of all the different states of my application. Right now. And so right now, you can see that my application, like as far as Connecting clients is concerned, it can only be in two, in two different kinds of states, and that's not so bad. But it's also not, you know, we're talking about scalability in other sense, but this isn't scalable in terms of the code organization things. You can imagine that you, uh, over time, you might build up a long, long list of all these different conditions of uh, all the different states, all the different ways you might want to handle when someone connects. So instead, what I ended up doing was, for this case, was um, having this very, very generic. Uh, handler function for the connection event, and then it was referencing a variable that I could then reset as I wanted to. So that no matter what, uh, whenever something connected, it was always going to be calling this socket handler's that connection uh, method. It was going to be applying it uh, with any arguments that came here. So then elsewhere, as the state of my server changed, and as I realized there's more parts, like for instance, one thing that I haven't really talked about yet, or yeah, is that um, uh, we were we were shooting to support uh, rebroadcasting. So because this the broadcast may be syndicated, we wanted to be able to rebroadcast the original recorded events in real time. And so that's like another state that we might get into. And it's um, you know yet another time we might want to change what happened when clients first connect. Because in that case, what we were doing is we were going to send the entire recording as just one payload, so all the data about the entire recording, and then on the client kind of fake live by doing like set timeouts and saying like, oh, this happened like, you know, in five minutes, and this happened in five minutes and three seconds. Um, and so in that case, like this, this I was finding to be a little bit more scalable um, because it let me change it without having to change actually, it let me change what happened when things connected without actually changing the content of that one. So version 1.0 of socket IO is on the way, uh, and I, I'll talk about this a little bit more towards the end of my presentation, but um, what this means is that specifics, like even, even going into this is probably too much detail because I can't guarantee that this is going to be the same when they do release 1.0. Uh, it's, it's been kind of in pre-release mode for a while now. Um, and actually, if you, go this, if you go to the wiki, I mean, if you go to the GitHub page, you'll see that at the top of their documentation, it was this. This corresponds to the upcoming one. So they've already they've already updated their master branch to be 1.0, but it's not released yet because you saw as as you saw here, uh, their website is still the original uh, 0.9. So that's a long way of saying that. Uh, Talking about specifics about 09 is a bit tricky because they're going to change, and then talking about, but then again, talking about specifics of 1.0 is tricky because they're not set in stone yet. So this is something you should be aware of if you're getting ready to develop an application on top of Socket.io and trying to decide what makes sense for you, like the the kind of stability of 09 or the improvements in future of 1.0. Okay. Uh, actually, is there any questions about that part? Yeah? From my understanding, like, you're going to use like the 1.0 now. Do you, you use Engine IO? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, it's it, it, but you won't use it directly. So it's a requirement. Yeah, so it's sort of like if you work with um, Express, and Express uses Connect. But as, as a user of the Express library, you don't necessarily care that it's using Connect. It's a dependency of that. But I'll, I'll talk a little more about the difference between uh, Sock.io 0.9 and 1.0 and what I is in a bit. Anything else? Okay. Uh, so next, we'll talk about configuring a real-time server. So some things that I came up with up across that uh, were interesting are uh, for getting this getting the server, which I said you know uh, was running on Rackspace in my case, uh, ready to be in production and serving people. So the first thing is the threat model for security. So I'm not really a security guy. Uh, I like to pretend that I am sometimes, but uh, I think in reality I have a healthy fear of anything where I have to be responsible for security in any way. Uh, so lucky for me though, we have um, a Debian developer who co-works here. And so he was like really, really helpful to me, like learning a lot of uh, just basically like what the, security, what the security concerns are when you're running a web server generally, and then what that can specifically mean for a Node.js service. And so what I'm bringing my high-level security threats down into are password guessing attempts, um, private key theft, and then compromise the actual application logic that you've written. So um, those are like kind of just the high-level general things that I wanted to take care of. And um, these are the ways that I, I did. So for <coughs> password guessing, I kind of eliminated that as a possibility by disallowing password login to the SSH. Um, and so really, you want to be using um, public, public cloud keys to log into your machine uh, because it's not susceptible to just like brute force. Well, it's, I guess if anything's susceptible to brute forcing, but it's not realistic to form a brute force attack against a, a public key the same way it is against you know, some uh, eight character password that's like you know, within your dot or something like that. So um, that's, a, that's a good idea right off the bat is to disallow SSH um, password access to the root user, but any, actually really to any user that you want to log in. So then from there, we're worried about private key theft. So um, I recommend creating a dev user, which is the dev user you actually get stuff done with, and then giving that user pseudo rights. And so this is kind of Unix, or this is like Unix terminology for how you deal with uh, administrator privileges. Um, and so I don't want to I don't want to spend too much time on those details. I mean, just, do people generally know what I mean by pseudo rights? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, if you do this, then the, the benefit here is that you your if your key is compromised, for instance, if some, if you leave your machine running or if someone else gets your key in there, they will log into the system. They still need a password to actually get something uh, meaningful done. So uh, that kind of protects you in that case. And then finally, as far as uh, compromising the application logic, and this is honestly something I did not do in that, and it wasn't something that really occurred to me until after the fact, was to create a separate user from dev even, that's you know, called node or node or something like that, that's actually gonna run the application. So in my case, I just had the dev user run the application. And what that means from a security standpoint is that the application has all the same rights that the dev user does. But if you create a, a third user that isn't root, that isn't dev, but it's something even more uh, deprivileged, then if, for instance, you're, um, you write your application in some unsafe way, like you use eval, because everybody loves to use eval, and you're, um, and you're just evaluating uh, code that comes in, then you can limit what the application itself is capable of doing. So uh, what's useful for this as well is like, so then, the actual directory that the application lives in then could be the belong to the dev user. And so that way, if uh, the application couldn't do anything like installing modules or something like that, it couldn't start deleting files. But this is all, uh, this is all contextual what your application will need to do. It's most likely your application will need to know about some of the files that it's probably going to be serving some of them. So, um, so yeah, this, this is just a way to be as restrictive as possible about the privileges that each um, level of security. All right. Um, so, in, in 
As far as technical requirements, the first is obviously Node.js. Um, and so what you can do is you can just run the binary or you can build it from source. Um, and then if you're, if you're really like tinfoil hat, you can use the checksum and make sure that when you downloaded it, there wasn't some, somebody in the middle that was like switching out your packets and like, you know, you know, evil Node.js. <laughs> um, and what I learned is that the, the you know, canonical or appropriate place to put this kind of stuff is in the op directory in, in Linux. And that's not a record that I have even been aware of or used ever before. So there's a ton about what the Unix file system looks like and what it's supposed to look like and what you know, people with um, you know, way too much time on their hands have thought about this kind of thing. I, I, I didn't want to do any kind of beard, but uh, you know, people generally tend to have facial hair when it comes to that. But uh, this is all, uh, yeah, way too much information about where files, where you're supposed to put your files if you want to be friends with your cool kids. So, um, and I mean, I want to be friends with the cool kids, but I don't want to be friends with the cool kids that bad. So I'm just going to say, like, okay, my Debian developer friend, so I'm going to put an op, and I'll put an op. But honestly, like, I just kind of like that because there's a ton of stuff in uh, USR, and there's, there's a ton of stuff in uh, everywhere else in my system. And I like kind of the, um, it, makes it makes it easier for me to think about when I just have, like, um, opt joint node. Like, that makes a lot of sense to me. And if you um, go to my blog, my blog post that Boaz mentioned, I talk a little bit more about um, what, uh, how, how you can further separate that so that you can support multiple versions of Node, which is actually really relevant on a night like tonight where we're thinking about, you know, maybe trying out Node um, to your tech. And so there's ways that you can, you can expand this installation such that like, um, changing over to a new version of Node is as simple as changing a symbol. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and then, just importantly, what you'll want to do though is you'll want to um, change the permit, change the owner of the node directory to your dev user. And the reason why you do this is so that you can install packages globally without sudo writes. Um, and so that's really a nice piece. Uh, it just makes things easier. And that's what I do, like on my personal system anyway. And what it also means though is that any random package that I install that, had, that installs a binary isn't going to have, is it itself going to have um, admin rights on the machine. All right, another technical requirement is uh, locking down dependencies. So everyone here is more or less familiar with um, package.json for tracking your dependencies. And there's like this whole, um, there's this whole uh, like language for specifying what the dependencies should be. You can use stars, you can use tildes. You can use X and numbers and dots, and it's a, all like, a lot of fun. But um, what what some people like what, what's easy to forget though is that specifying so in semantic versioning or are people familiar with semantic versioning? Okay, so in case you aren't, um, it's just it's just a method for specifying the version of software in such a way that uh, these numbers actually carry some meaning. Uh, to developers using that software. And so it's the, the kind of classical, well, classic for Node.js is um, a pattern of, of three numbers separated by dots. And, but what some people don't realize is that just because you, you specify that your package wants to be at you know, 1.0.7, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the code underneath that isn't going to change. So, when you specify a, a version uh, that as specifically as you can the semantic version, uh, as far as I am concerned, is concerned, that means that it's going to always fetch from um, from the repository code that's been published at that version. And so any dependencies that that code depends on is going to be fetched according to that package's dependencies, uh, that package uh, version numbers. So if I have uh, socket.io 0.9.11, for instance, and, um, and I think that, you know, okay, that's great. It can't be any more specific than we're going to change. There's actually two problems there. Um, one is that the things that Socket IO itself depends on might change without them changing their version number. And so, um, so that's generally not a bad thing because generally maintainers won't change their dependencies without 
uh, a good reason. But also, uh, most libraries don't specify their versioning that specifically. So if we go back to select.io, we can check out their package JSON. And so you can see here, like, debug, or actually send is a good example. So some of these, so the, their internal dependencies are, are very specifically version. But so send is, is version in 0, 1, 0, with a tilde. So that means that anything 0, 1, 0 to um, anything other, less than 0, 2 will be satisfied with this. Which means that even though you specified um, socket IO here, we'll say at 1.0.0, 1. 1. 0. 0, that any time that could change. So that's one problem. Um, and uh, the thing that's intended to solve that is uh, NPM shrink wrap. So here, who, who knows about NPM shrink wrap? Some people. Okay, cool. No, 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 this is good. This is good. This means that I'm not just talking to uh, a bunch of people that already know everything. So <laughs> what, what this, what NPM shrink wrap, NPM shrink wrap is a command that actually crawls your node modules folder and um, notes down the, ver the explicit version of every single package recursively throughout the folder. Um, and so the best way to look at that might be to actually go to um, directory that doesn't. So why don't I go to the so I'll go to the map center and so this is this is uh, the application that I made for that we made for PBS. And so I can do here and the <coughs> So now it's generating a file, it's complaining about different files not having readmes. And gem file lock or like hip freeze equivalent? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, great, great. So if you're familiar with either of those things from uh, Python, hip freeze, or from uh, Ruby gem, gem file not lock, it's the equivalent. So what it's doing is it's actually just going to, uh, like I said, recursively traverse all your dependencies and note down what each one is, is at. And so if I actually had my dependencies resolved on this machine, We'd be able to do this, but it would just spit out a npm shrink wrap file that would specify that. And then other developers, you could version control that if you wanted to, and then other developers use that and install from that, and then it would recursively fetch those specific dependencies. And so that gives you, that buys you some uh, protection from things chaining up from underneath you. Um, but if you're, one, one, one problem with doing that is if you're developing a module, that kind of, then I would recommend strongly against that. Is that kind of breaks, uh, I guess, convention in of like I guess open source in general, and the idea of like being very progressive with uh, bug fixes and things like that. Is that generally like if you're writing a module that other other people might use, you want to opt in to um, you want to opt in the bug fixes and things like that. So uh, this is why like semantic versioning is good, is that you can specify like okay, if if I'm depending on library foo and library foo bumps its patch version, then I know that most likely it's not going to break my code using semantic version of what a patch release actually means. And so it's a good idea to have to just kind of opt into that because if you use a lockdown file, you would never get those new things. So you want to, if you're developing a package, you want to be as um, like accepting as possible in terms of like your, your dependencies and what is acceptable. But then if you're developing an application that you're deploying um, for production, it's not something that you're publishing in PM necessarily. You want to be uh, more stringent so you can get a better idea of what's going on. Have you seen the pure dependencies? Yes, I haven't used them. Have you used them? Uh, not really. Okay. I've heard that it kind of it works. It is supposed to help with that problem of like you're developing a library that will be used with some other library. Um, and you both depend on the third library and getting that version together. Yeah. 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 We, we use pure dependencies in Grunt before now, and uh, it's uh, you can basically scrape for things like except plugins that are not direct. Like a Grunt plugin doesn't depend on Grunt, you can go on the side with Grunt, and you can, your plugin can say, this plugin works with Grunt. 
and then if someone tries to use it with Prime 1.3, NPM will come out, and that's where the trigger comes through. So it's more like a point system. So that's, that's another feature of NPM that's actually a new feature of NPM. Um, and so in the same way that you, in your package.json, you, we, <laughs> it's really new. All the time, <laughs> like, that's half, I, I want to use DuckDuckGo, but so many times it's, uh, <laughs> This is where they were announced as being part of NPM, and this is just in the beginning of February. And so, um, this is an NPM documentation. And even Google, I will say, even Google, this is number five, so come on, that's not. That the actual report for us look first. Yeah, yeah, the actual report for us. I don't know. So, anyways, um, yes, yeah, so this, is, this is pretty new, but it's a uh, kind of interesting uh, distinction that you can make when you're building your packages. Um, right. So, oh, I was going to actually shrink that now. No. I'm, uh, you know, I, just, uh, I don't want to shrink that. That's, that's boring. <laughs> um, so, though, that's actually not enough. If you want to really be, um, really, if you want to really be conservative, and who, wants, who doesn't want to be really conservative, isn't that great? Is, uh, and you have a shrink wrap can uh, fail you. Your code can still change even if you recursively define to the patch release all the dependencies of your app. And the reason for that, does anyone know why? Anyone other than Ben know why? Mm -hmm. Architecture? Snapshot? If they don't update the package JSON? Okay. okay, yes. I yes. Source change, but we didn't update all the version. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, exactly. So, in other words, you can do, if, if you're in package maintainer, you can do npm publish, and then you can do force. And so if, you, what you can do is you can change out your source code without modifying the dependency. And so you can, so you can this force will actually just push whatever version uh, you're currently specifying in your package. So you can, you can go back in time and, and force push like old, old versions if you wanted to. So what that means though is that if what you're doing in your your application, you know, you have a production app, and you say, like, okay, I want this to function exactly the same today as it functioned yesterday, and if, and if I have to reinstall my, my dependencies, I won't have to do the same. What this means is that, um, you know, whoever's maintaining these things has the ability to change your, your code out from under you. So, um, even if you're using shrink wrap. And so that's why uh, NPM lockdown is necessary if you want to be very, as I said, very conservative. Um, in that, what npm lockdown does is it's act, it actually checks um, it actually checks just checks something of the dependencies so that it knows that okay so if this this module says it's one thing but I'm actually going to check um, what the files look like and see if they've actually changed from uh, what we know them to be so uh, like I said if there's a seal some reason. Uh, and so the, but the project page talks about this the motivation that we've been talking about today, um, why you might want to use it. So this is, again, not something that you should really be doing if you're developing a, a module for other people to consume, but if you're doing something on a production server where you want to have as much assurance as you can about reproducibility, then uh, this is the way to go. Hey, Mike. Yes? Is there a, a benefit or drawback to using NPM lockdown versus just committing your entire node modules folder? Do you know? Because um, we know if you commit your node modules folder with your project and push it, like, yes, there'll be a lot more crap in there, but the code will all be right there, right? You'll be getting binaries that are architecture dependent. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what's that? Uh, you'll, you'll have binaries in that folder that are architecture dependent. So if you're moving from 32 bit to 64 bit Linux, mm -hmm. NPM lockdown would work, but yeah, sorry, yeah, the that's a good point. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Perfect. Cool. Yeah, I was just going to say that, like, I think that version controlling and dependency is gross, but that's <laughs> 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 All right. So, uh, if we're going to do a stress test, then we need to get data because um, it's all only going to say, hey, like this looks good, or hey, this is really failing. 
but you need to know, you're probably going to need to know why, so you need to be able to inspect this, the state of your server and see what's going on inside. So one tool that you might use is HTOP. Um, a lot of people here have probably used TOP before, and this is what TOP looks like. It's just giving me some diagnostics about my system. You can see how many tasks I'm running, the CPU load, memory usage, and specifically what the tasks are, and the percentage of time, CPU time they're using. Um, but uh, HTOP is a little bit nicer, because it's colorized, and it has some bar graphs, and actually it also responds to nose clicks. Um, so I can like, start sorting and stuff like that. So um, if you want to be getting real-time data um, in kind of a, a semi-graphical form, then uh, this, is, this is really nice. And so uh, if you're running a Debian-like system, you know, to a Debian or something like that, you can, you can get that with um, it just the package is in HTML. So that's cool, but uh, it's really tough to use that data to analyze that data, like especially later. Um, and I'm, I'll, I'll be honest, when I was first getting started with this, like I said, I'm still kind of finding my feet with, with Unix sometimes. Um, the best thing that I initially came up with was actually piping the, this data out into a file and then later like, introspecting this file. So kind of snapshotting with this text and grossly like, transforming it to try to get numbers out of it. It was awful. It was terrible. Um, What's much better is, is SAR. So um, you can get this pack this package on uh, uh, apt is sysdat. And so I can show you what this looks like. So I'll run SAR and I'll tell it <coughs> I want information on sockets and I want to update once every second. And so this is what it be. Okay. Still so basically um, you can see the heading here is telling you about the total sockets of TPC. TCP sockets, UDP sockets, and the raw sockets. And this is, um, and it's giving me the time for each one. And I can also output that to a file. So, I can't remember. Okay, so I can output that to the file with that. So I can say, yeah. Maybe I can't do that. Uh, I cannot type it because it's actually a little bit. Oh, oh, it's, oh, it's, oh, excuse me. So the reason why it's better than redirecting is because um, this data is being collected and it's not just typing it out. So if I now if I did if I cat it out my dot star, it's actually binary data. Because what, what SAR is doing is um, it's outputting all the data that SAR is capable of collecting into that file. So despite the fact that I only asked to look at um, socket information, you can think of those flags being sort of like a view or a window of the, the data it's collecting. And so um, this is really nice because it lets you look at what you think is relevant while you're running the data. <coughs> but you also know that maybe like because you weren't thinking about what like um, you weren't thinking to count like the zombie processes that are running in the background or something. Um, but you know that because you're running SAR, because you're doing its, out, uh, its output mechanism, you're actually collecting the data and writing it. So that you, it'll be available to you later. Um, and so what you can do from here, so this is where the F <coughs> is you can use SAR to replay a recording that you made with SAR. And so I can just run this and then I can see um, all the data that I just collected. But if I go to SAR again, and we say, like, let's see. Uh, bus. So I can do, instead I can do with bus. Here we go. So, alright, I'm not a SAR master. Um, what you can do though is you can use this stuff and I fix it. Okay. Promise. Alright, I don't promise. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's not I don't know. 
but it's, 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 it's less important. Basically, I think everyone here is capable of reading man pages. So you read the man pages and figure out what the actual flags are, and then you don't have to sit here and watch me try to struggle through it in front of you. So pretend like I knew what I was doing, and pretend like you were very impressed when you saw that actually we can use that file to inspect any part of the system state later as though we're, you know, as we're recording, as though we were just replaying. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 thank you, thank you. That's a lot of my comments. So, um, that's really great. So that's something that, when you're running your stress test, it's a great idea to be collecting this data kind of idly in the background, and that way you're not so stressed by being like, oh, wait, am I looking at the memory, or am I looking at the CPU speed, like the CPU usage? Like, you can just kind of say, I'm getting that data, and I can view it in all these, I can transform it however I want later, and then export it to Excel and start making nice graphs. Um, so yeah, try out some that's pretty cool stuff. Any questions about that? Yes? Try New Relic. New Relic? I have not. It puts all of that information to a UI that you can look at. Yeah. Yeah. I would put it out in those people with crap. Okay, Mr. Cool Crap. New, new relic like this? It's a, it's a web service rather than software that you can download. It's a company that sells a, I think, a web service. Cool. Yeah, there's one screen where we use the introduction for it. Yeah. It's definitely something you can like, it takes like 3% of your application performance and it gives you all these fancy graphs about why your shit pooped the bed and why. Um, why it's running slow, and it gives you like graphs about why your CPU is failing. And stuff. It's really useful. It's totally great. And there's a free version. And there's a free version. Oh, they give you a t-shirt to sign up for the free version. Uh, if we get a t-shirt back in, it's sealed the deal. Hello. I'm still struggling with this imagery of my shit in the bed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool, cool. So, new relic. Nice. That's why we have disaster recovery. <laughs> All right. So moving right along, we are gathering a swarm. Now this is the this is the meeting of the presentation. This is why we're here. It's uh, learning what it's like to simulate this because I built this. We built this and um, knew right away like okay, they're expecting ten thousand concurrent users, and that's a really big number to to me uh, and really frightening. And so like. My initial reaction was like, oh, well, why don't I just do some mathematics? Like, that's easy and cheap, and you know, I can, I can do that on my back end. Uh, back and, that thing. and then quickly I realized there are way too many bigger bills, and there's way too much I don't know uh, for any sort of math to really tell me anything useful about how my application actually performs. This is just such a complex, what we're talking about is such a complex scenario. There's no way that I could not even write it, I would ever reasonably write it. Uh, <coughs> to capture this one. So and then I started looking at well, how can we actually simulate this instead? Instead of doing um, instead of just doing that, how can we actually put our application through the paces and see how we can truly respond in some sort of controlled environment? So uh, what we want is to be able to run this as a script so we can repeat it uh, as many times as we want. It's not enough, like, so what that immediately says that a solution is not, I get 10 of my friends to all of the application, and all of them open up a bunch of browser windows and then tell me how fast they thought it was. Um, what we want is something that we can actually from the command line as many times as we want. So, like, possible solutions are scripting a real browser to run your application, so it could be some, a tool like Selenium. Uh, have you guys heard of Selenium? So this is... Selenium, it's, let's, it has like drivers for different browsers, so you can tell browsers to go to different uh, uh, URLs and to interact with the page, like click here or type there. Um, but as you might imagine, like if I want to simulate 10,000 connections, I'm not going to start up 10,000 tabs in Chrome. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm like, even, and it doesn't even scale like really horizontally that I'm not going to have. 100 machines that each do um, 100 connections because that's still a lot of browsers. So that was out. Then I thought, uh, then I thought, well, what about using PhantomJS? I'm assuming many more people have heard of PhantomJS. 
And I'm nodding at, yeah, nodding. So uh, in PhantomJS, you can run uh, web, a WebKit browser from the command line, so it's headless. So you're actually starting up the full graphics stack that you need to um, render a page and all the UI around. Um, and plus, it's in JavaScript, so the API that you use to control is uh, itself in JavaScript, which is, which is nice. But this is still really heavyweight, um, and it's still kind of not, doesn't make sense to try to do this with 10,000 people who distribute it. So, uh, the third, a third option would be to actually strip out the network module and then run that in isolation in Node.js itself. And so, this um, this has this had some legs to it, and this is why earlier I was advocating the idea of modularizing your logic, specifically your network logic, <coughs> because if um, the line that says connect to the server, and if the line that describes how to connect to the server is this, is next to the line that says how to you know uh, set the HTML the button element, then there's no way you're going to get that to run Node.js. But if you separate these things out, such that um, <coughs> Network module is relatively compartmentalized, and you, you have a chance to do this, which is not run a whole browser, but just run uh, a process in Node. Uh, and so we all know, and inherently I think, because we're here, we know of what Node can be capable of in terms of scaling for a lot of uh, a lot of simultaneous actions. And so that's exactly the same. So exactly the same reason that you might want to write your web server in Node. Is the reason why I want to simulate a bunch of uh, connections to stress test them. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So 
like to it to ballot. Um, and then I, I exposed the IO node here. And then, um, so now I know that my client module is, is not running to bound to uh, Node.js's uh, same IO object that's right here. So, um, also, uh, so we're, we're building the script to simulate a bunch of concurrent connections. Another thing that you're going to want to con consider is a runtime configuration. So I'm using, I use the Optimist library, and so this is just one of a, a, a few really nice libraries from Node.js for parsing command line options. And maybe as an example, I can show you an example of what it looks like. Yeah. So here you can see it, it's the API is, is really simple to define. Like these are the parameters that I might want to change. These are the short forms, the long forms, default values, whether they're required or not. And this is really great for if, uh, well, basically these you want to have as much flexibility as you can for when you're running your stress test. You don't want to necessarily have to change your code and re-update your code um, every time but you, something new occurs to you. Uh, so this lets you kind of scale back or scale up your stress test in real time uh, easily. If you just parameterize as much about this as quick as you can. So uh, also it's worth noting that like you might want to be collecting data from your simulated clients. Uh, so in, in addition to collecting data on the server that's serving the application, you might want to collect data about what the simulated clients are experiencing in terms of uh, their interaction with the application. And if you do this, you'll want to you know, have some way to write down the results that you're getting, or to, to store the results you're getting. So first I was thinking, oh, I'll just use uh, files, I'll, I'll do write file. Um, and I, you know, I'll make it asynchronous, and it'll be fine using it's asynchronous, and we all know we talked about why that's a good idea. But um, to be even more conservative, because like, you are, you know, you are running a bunch of these, a bunch of client simulators, and, uh, you're simulating a lot of clients on one machine, and having them all write to disk, even asynchronously, is going to tie up the disk, and it's going to have a uh, performance <coughs> impact on the simulator. It it's, uh, might be a good idea just to write it to memory, and then and then grab that from memory um, after the after the test is over. So the way that I did this was I had my client simulator also run on a web server, and then it would respond. Um, it would respond to requests with the, the data that it had gathered. And so you can see here, that's what's going on here, is that the this is, again, the same script we've been looking at so far, which is the client simulator, the thing that pretends like it's you know, a, a whole bunch of people. Um, it just happens to also be running a web server. And so when you make requests to a certain endpoint on that web server, it'll dump out the data that it's collected so far. So that way, I can say, keep it in memory, don't worry about trying to write it to disk while you're actually writing the tests. But when the tests are over, um, then I'm, I'm going to pay you for the data, and you can clear it out and just give it to me. Um, and then finally, it's dispersing client connections is, is, is important. And this is something that I initially got bit by, is that initially, I just said, OK, if I want to have a, if I want to have each simulator pretend like it's uh, like 500 clients and just have them, you know, just start them all immediately because you know I want to get to work. But um, I mean, that should seem like kind of unrealistic to you, just like conceptually. Like, are, are you really running an application where like it's like okay, it's eight o'clock, everyone immediately signs on at exactly the same time? So like, there's that which is like kind of feels for you. But what it, the implication of that also though is that the underlying protocol that Socket.io uses uses heartbeats to make sure that all these people are connected and, and it keeps the connection alive. Because web sockets are always open, but uh, other transport mechanisms are not always open. Um, so like if you're using long polling, you need to send heartbeats to keep that connection alive. So if you have all your simulated clients connected at exactly the same moment, then all of their heartbeats are going to happen at exactly the same time. <coughs> and that's going to kind of have adverse effects in your tests. And it's, like I said, this happened to me because I was looking at my data and it spikes every like 25 seconds. And it's because it's not that I was sending, I was sending more application, application level data, but I was sending all of them a heartbeat. Um, but they were all sending me a heartbeat at the same time in sync. So um, when you're seeing really a lot of clients, 
This is all a long way of saying you just disperse that over time so it's more realistic when you don't have to worry about these odd syn uh, synchronization effects that can take place. Okay. So, um, AWS is what we're going to use to actually run this stuff. Or maybe before we do that, I'll just do a small demonstration of what it looks like to run this, this server. So um, I'm just going to run the uh, I'm going to run the simulator just locally on the machine. Uh, see, I've got the dependencies. I'm going to jump on AWS. So for the purposes of testing here, somewhere, somewhere. So for the purposes of testing tonight, you know, I'm still, I don't have a, a rack space um, myself, but I do have um, a dummy server running on EC2. So EC2 is just providing a server as though we're running the web, as though we're back to server. Um, let's see. So let's see here. All right. So this is the Python <laughs> server. What I need to do is connect to this. So I have two connections to the back of the server, make this a little bigger. Um, and let me change into the record here. We talked about before how this server is it's, ser it's serving it's certain files, so you have to be aware of where it is. So right now it's continuing to not know where it is. <laughs> so uh, we'll say.
And uh, I should say that this laptop is a little bit underpowered. And she likes to <laughs> Because 
your instances are going to be short lived. They're not actually serving anything. No one's going to be accessing them. And even if they were compromised for the one hour that you kept them up, I mean, there, there's not much interest in them that you could do with them. Um, and uh, I should also say, like, that, um, oh, yeah, we're definitely getting into kind of morally gray areas because it is, is, as far as, like, this is, this is all well and good for you to be pointing these things at your machines to test how they interact with load, but if you decide one day that, like, you know, you're really, you're really angry at Hacker News and maybe you just want to point, you want to point these things at Hacker News, like, this isn't to say that, you know, uh, 10 of these low power instances are really going to make a dent there, but there's certainly um, smaller targets that could Things you could break. What's that? Things you could break. Things you could break with this, exactly. So, um, yeah, with great power comes great responsibility. That's what the uh, problem is. So, uh, my last recommendation is that you install your VCS <coughs> to the uh, to these instances when you're running. So that way, if you decide, like, oh, there's something about my client logic that I didn't really think, my similar logic that I didn't really think through, that it's not a process of, like, oh, making a whole new image or you know, FTP and code up there, you can just do a, you know, um, a git poll or whatever, what, what have you. Okay, so I use this library, as some of you have noticed, called Bees with Machine Guns. This was made by um, the folks at the Chicago Tribune. And what this, what they build this, to do is to stress test servers. Uh, but specifically, they, it's built to stress test Apache bench with Apache Benchmark. So um, what, what it is, it's a Python utility that kind of wraps these two, um, these two libraries. One is uh, Boto, which is uh, Amazon's utility for interacting with AWS with their EC2 instances, uh, or with e AWS at large, I should say. And then the other library is Paramico, which is a library for um, using SSH uh, from Python. And so what this lets you do though, is this lets you, what these machine guns lets you do, is it lets you um, kind of administer a bunch of machines running at the same time and send them commands so they all act together in unison. Um, so unfortunately though, Apache Benchmark isn't a meaningful way to stress test a new JS application. So um, I had to take that in my very limited knowledge of Python and make something that was generalized such that instead of running a Apache benchmark, we just run arbitrary shell commands. So now what I what I made was a fork of this project where basically you tell it to start with a bunch of EC2 instances and then you can just start rattling off whatever shell commands you want and it will forward them out to all of them and they will all execute and then uh, pipe their standard back to you. Um, and so that's what we're going to do uh, right now. All right, um, so everybody ready? Yeah, okay. Is anyone excited? <laughs> yeah, that's, what, that's great. So, um, see we're still here, we're still running our server, and it is sitting here, it's having the time of its life. It's like, oh, I have nine connections, this is easy. I'm running a node process, who cares, no one's connected to it. There was some time, like, you know, 10 minutes ago, we saw 30 people connected, that was, you know, no big deal. But I didn't know that what we're about to do is we're about to start up 10 instances on EC2 and have each one of those 10 instances start 500 simulated clients and have all those things connect to it uh, at the same time. And your server is just one box, you're not doing like load balancing? And no, one box. It's no, just one. no. And, and actually right now my server is itself an EC2 micro instance. So my server is in no way ready for production. <laughs> um, so it's, 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 this is, this is going to be fun. It's going gonna, it's gonna to choke. <laughs> I, I can tell you guys are up for blood. And we're gonna get um, where are we? I don't know where I am. <laughs> okay, okay. I found out where I am. Now, um, I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm going to paste in a command because to get started you need to specify a lot of information. You need to specify what instant, what, um, what a mach machine image you want to use. So pr prior to tonight I had set up a machine and told it that it was going to be my client simulator. I installed the OJS, I installed my application, and like I said I installed the VCS, so that's why I installed Git onto it. 
And so, and then I saved it as an image. And so now I can start up any number of instances based on that image that I'll be exactly for this. So I need to specify that. I need to specify that key that you saw I was using, the boku-pps key, so that I can authenticate into it. Um, and I need to tell it what zone I want to be in. So I'm going to set them all up in uh, US East, just so um, the commands going back and forth are quick for demonstration. But we can set them up in different places all over the all of them. I'm just gonna, um, so that command is, is here. Okay, so is this in? Oh boy, stuff, stuff just went bad. All right, stuff went bad earlier than we wanted it to go bad. Let's, let's, let's slow down a little bit and see what's going on. I think you ran one too many instances. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, so since I'm already running one instance in AC2, the free usage tier only lets me to run, I think actually any usage tier only allows me to run. So I should say that. I'll just say that I can't run more than two more than one, and I'm already running one. So let's just do 10. That was, that was a good call. I would have been debugging that for like an hour, and I would have gotten tired, and then listen. Okay, so. These are machine guns. This is a fork, so I'm still mostly using their code. So I'm still mostly using their, their kind of cutesy language for, you know, it's connecting to the hive, and it's, starting, it's calling out 10 Bs, and they're loading the machine guns. Meanwhile, I go over to the AWS uh, management console. I can see here, this is the production server that I'm running. These are two Bs that I ran earlier, but they're terminated now because um, uh, I was just testing. But when I refresh, I see that <coughs> these 10 new ones are starting up. So then we go back over here, we look at this guy, he still has no idea what's about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, wait here, uh, over here, okay. And so it's telling us they're getting ready for the attack one by one. <laughs> so if we are up and running, we'll be able to actually start sending these shell commands to them. And so we, I mean, I, I, I just ran the client simulator from this laptop, so we can know what, generally what it's going to look like, it won't be too different. But um, just so you're aware, like I'm going to have to update the code because um, I didn't making that machine image is kind of a hassle, and so the machine image now is operating on an old version of the code base. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is update the code. Still waiting. It's probably useful to point out that like these instances that I killed when I started the talk, they're still hanging around unless it's terminated. I remember getting really all like bent out of shape about that. Like, why they listed there, she didn't go away, and I would really charge for them, but they kind of sit around for like half an hour or something before they're, they're cleaned up. Just so you know that yes, like you did want to get an hour or Cool. Swarm has assembled 10 Bs. <laughs> so if we want to be further convinced, we can do Python Bs. So now I have the IPs and all 10 ones that are running. So I'm just waiting to do whatever I can help them. <laughs> I, still, I, I still can't get over the like, I remember when I first did this, just how crazy it was that I could just be like, at my desk and be like, oh, just give me 10 computers and then you have to do whatever else. That's a pretty cool <laughs> library, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, OK. So now the first thing I'm going to do is that. So, um, so yeah. Initially, uh, Beasel Machine Guns has an API that's really nice for like basically working with Apache benchmarks. So the Beasel Machine Guns API looks a lot like the Apache benchmark API. You can specify uh, command line flags that are special that are uh, specific to that library. Because it, was, it was built with that library in mind. But because this ugly hacked up for is supposed to just do ex arbitrary shell commands, then it's not really, the API is a little bit nasty. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say bees um, exec. Um, because you have bees report, you have bees up, you have bees uh, attack. But <laughs> that's all the stuff that uh, comes with bees machine gun. So I am going to the sub command bees exec. So I'm going to output it to, um, say, Boston node. So this is going to be all their standard output when it comes back. So I'm going to do dash, and now everything that comes after this is a command that gets sent over SSH and then uh, executed. So what we do right now just to convince ourselves is, I think it's, uh, I want to say, I wish we got this, I think it's plus 
percent in? Yeah, okay. So that's the date plus percent in is going to give us the, the current time in the end of seconds. So this is just a way for us to be sure that everything's um, working and that these are actually from the machines. So since so I can it off, we're all executing it. No, they're not taking this long to execute. <laughs> 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 what, yeah, where's most of the delay coming from? Um, as far as I can tell, it, it's not always, sometimes, yeah, as far as I can tell, it's just network overhead, like, uh, orchestrating all this and waiting for all of it. <laughs> 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 and so now we see that, yeah, we have oh. responses all from Canada to all, uh, yeah, Canada's like, cool. So this is where things start to get a little bit ugly. Is like, so now I have to do, okay, so now I have to do uh, CD in the map center directory. And then I want to git fetch who. And then I want to um, git checkout master. And then I want to git merge. <laughs> <laughs> Now, all 10 these are going to do all those things. <laughs> are you a reason giving up with that so much? I, <laughs> I should say, though, like, yeah, you can't do your own, your, your own home too much. Like, this isn't actually that powerful, but like, it's, fun to, it's fun to sit here and throw it in and tell you what you want. Okay, so um, not notes, but Boston notes. Cool. So now we have 10 identical responses. Um, <coughs> they're all updated and all ahead of master. All telling you about the fast forward merge. So great. So now they're all to do. All right. I think we're ready to do this. So, one thing I wish that I had done is I wish I had just put the project into the root directories. Every command I do, most of the time, every command I do, I have to preface with CD and Pepsi. Because this is, it is making, this is part of the overhead as well. It's an entirely new SSH connection that's making every time. And so it's then closing down the SSH connection. So first, instead of just maintaining one constant one, it's sending it, it's opening in one for everything. So every time you open a new connection, it's going to start in the home, home directory with the CD in your project, or hybrid. All right. CD in the map center. No. CD in the map center. Slash. Backend. Slash. Stress. And forever. Has anyone heard of forever? Some people have heard of forever, but not everyone nodded, so I'm going to talk about it. You'll learn. You'll learn. So, <laughs> um, uh, when, yeah, so when you uh, run a process, and like a node process, you could see like when I was doing the verbose, it was just printing out information over time, and it was kind of tying up. Um, standard in. And so if we're using this library to make an SSH connection, it won't close that SSH connection until I kill that process, which is not a good thing. We want to, we want the, we want each one of them to, to uh, finish the SSH connection and then run it in the background. So that's essentially what we're doing. We're using forever, which is a Node.js library, to run our Node.js script in the background so that these connections we terminate will have um, will have standard in that. So and we forever instead of node, I'm going to tell it Run uh, start. Mike, do you have to set the environment variable for where to connect it? You are correct, Ben. <laughs> hey, that's, that's a good call. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so let's do that. Export. I have to get this thing again. Direction server. This one. I can't believe this URL is the <laughs> and run. So now I'm going to be running run. <laughs> Ten different machines all at once. Is this right? Let's see. Map Center. Export. No request to place that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So 
So if it runs the if forever and throws in the background it's just an SSH, SSH connection, you need to like do another one to like kill the process, like they kill something if you wanna Yeah. Yep. How do you then find the process to kill it? It's it's all part of the forever API. So we'll get to that stop. Oh okay. So we'll, we'll do that in just a second. So let's yeah, see. they have to create a service for you. Ah, uh, I see. Okay. Cool. Sweet. And now we can see the output of run on 10 different machines. <laughs> Let's put all the color codes in there too, that's why it is. Yeah. <coughs> um, okay, so now, uh, all right, see in the map center again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, see in the map center, specifically, uh, back, back in server. No, back in the client. No, no, stress. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, back in the stress. And forever start client. We're going to say C. Uh, we're going to do this over the course of 30 seconds. Number of clients 500. Yeah. And um, <coughs> that's. All I want to use, they're all going to be WebSocket, and I could use a different transport. So another option that I didn't talk about was I, I built in changing the transport. Um, but we'll use WebSockets, that's fine. It's going to be in there. Trust me. Uh, so, yes, I think we can do this. Four, eight, four, nine, nine, six, 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 nine, six
I'm not sure if it's going to let me do this. Sweet, sweet, OK. <laughs> so some systems uh, won't let you do this, even as like, uh, some systems it's just a little bit tough to do this. And I, I still don't really pick up on it. But um, the live, the, one thing I forgot to mention from the beginning of this is that the PBS application that we built is, was built entirely open source. So if you want to see information about how the application is built or about how the stress testing setup worked, including scripts to set up the back end, then you can check it out and do that. All right. Starting that up. Good. Recording nine socket connections. Good. Send them off again.
So this is broke. <laughs> <laughs> Something broke here, um, and this is less interesting than the bug, so I'm not going to. I'm going to finish up the presentation and then we'll call it night. Um, but that's what that looks like. Uh, I'm going to call. Actually, um, we're not quite done with the views yet. There's two. There's two things that we still have to do. Um, so one is we'll stop all them. So the B, well, I should say the B's are still on, we're just softening simulators. Um, so what we'll do first, for fun, is, let's see, yeah, we're going to start there. Something that happened to me when I was kind of, uh, you know, being really, playing fast and loose with uh, making changes on the fly, was I said, okay, I have to make changes to the simulator because I didn't think about this one thing that I wanted to do. So, now that I've made it locally and pushed it to GitHub, I'm going to log in, I'm going to send this command out to the users that are already running. It says git um, <coughs> merge boku stress x. And anyone that had an experiment in the branch name, you probably should be merging. And so I, I should have known better. But so I ran this command. And I'm like, okay, great. I'm going to run this command. They're all going to get these latest changes in my stress test. is going to work perfectly because I just fixed it. Um, and then as I want to do, I would cat out the results file. So this case we're going to call possible. And what I got this time was, oh, I have a merge conflict in 10 machines out in the cloud. <laughs> None of them are useful to me at all. Like, this is, uh, like, what do I do about this? Like, that's not really, that's not good. And so then it was like, first I freaked out and ran around the office for a bit. You know, like, what have I done? Oh, yeah, that's true, actually. Um, <laughs> and then I started thinking, wait, 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 wait. This, I, I, I generalize this tool. So I've only been using it on, on stress tests, but I know the command line pretty well, and I know Git. So like, why don't I just fix this as if it were one machine that were right here? So then I'm like, okay, see me in the map center, then Git uh, reset hard head, and then send that off. And so now all of them are saying, okay, I have all these conflicts, and I'm just gonna get rid of them. And then we see that they're on. So that was cool. But a little, little scary for us. All right, the last command that you need to know, and this is a very important command to know, is Python views down. So this is actually deactivating the EC2 instances. And you can convince yourself of returning to the address command the console, refreshing, and you can see they are all shutting down. Sweet. So that is that concludes the demonstration. Um, moving forward, then it's already asked about like possible extensions, and so one of them is certainly uh, making your simulator aware of uh, more realistic just, uh, gradient of uh, long calling web time connections according to your target. But also, um, your your application, your node application, is distributing across cores, and this is what I was doing a lot of work on to try to support entirely long calling connections. Um, I didn't get there, but what I would recommend is to start looking into using a separate process to do load balancing. You can stick in Node if you want. Uh, you can use Stud, and then Stud Proxy is a uh, Node module written to wrap around Stud, and that does TLS termination if you're running stuff with SSL. Um, and you use that if you that can then proxy out to a bunch of different uh, Node processes that are running processes. So if you're running a machine, you can kind of scale horizontally. Um, the other thing to be aware of is Socket.io 1.0. I said I'd get to this and uh, before we wrap up, I'll just mention that uh, Socket.io 1.0 is already built on, is already, but not, is already built on Engine.io. Even though it's not released yet, um, Engine.io is basically the transport mechanisms all modularized into uh, a separate uh, library. And so, and if you were to use Engine.io directly, you would still get this same behavior that Socket.io offers, which is uh, real-time on all different browsers, but the API is slower level, the API is compatible with web sockets. And then if you and then if you want to use Socket.io, which itself wraps Engine.io, in that case, you would get the Socket.io uh, API that people like, which has things like rooms and it has things like authentication. Um, and in both cases, one another major change for Engine.io, the Engine.io implements is uh, the way that it upgrades transports. So currently Socket.io, it does feature detection to use the best available transport for the browser. So if you're, if you're running Chrome, then it will end up choosing 
websites and then having an effect over that. The problem is that that is an unreliable process and it can take some time. And so for um, so for what they've done with Engine.io is they've assumed the baseline. So everyone that uses Engine.io, as soon as they connect, they'll make an initial connection with a, um, with a long polling connection. And that is very quick to make, and you know they'll be able to make it. And then if they can progressively enhance, they will upgrade that connection over time. But it saves them from having to wait uh, for when people with, that are capable of doing things wait for them to see if they can make it past the firewall or website and things like that. Um, so that's how you uh, So I've included some resources here. I've done, um, I've done an article series on this topic, and I try to make this presentation a little bit distinct from that stuff so that you know, if you've already read it, this would still be interesting. If you came here tonight, that would still be interesting. So I've also done screencasts of this stuff. Um, and this presentation will be up on GitHub later tonight. So I'm uh, juggling Mike on GitHub, and you can find that under uh, juggling Mike slash presentations. Um, that does it for me. Uh, do you have any questions? Yeah, um, so, yeah, so my server couldn't handle when I was doing 10,000 uh, long point connections. It just, it just died. It was, a, it was CPU win. And so that's what started me down the path of looking at, at distributing across cores. And just, you might be tempted to look into um, uh, Node.js's cluster module, which is intended for that kind of thing. But it's, um, it's really tricky. I'm not sure it's possible, so we get, it might be there to use a separate process. How long did this take and, and the setup to figure out and develop? And... Um, that's a good question. Like, I, to, to build the whole thing took about six weeks, I think. And then from there, it was kind of a pet project that I did when I found time. The stress um, testing part? Or the the whole yeah, most of the stress testing. I did the stress testing with WebSockets, mm -hmm. and I built up um, I built up the graphs in my first article um, in the course of that six weeks. But everything after that, I kind of felt like I was personally interested in from learning about uh, long polling, and that was all done afterwards. It's hard to say we don't have full time. What was PBS's original motivation for switching from what they had? Were they just worried there would be more traffic? Uh, so, well, what they had, what they had, wasn't capable of doing anything in real time. It was client side only, uh, and so like it was just something that you could visit and you could actually do calculations and calculate like, oh, this is who would win in this case and the team who would win in this case. So what they were interested in building was actually something that connect what was happening in the broadcast of screen to people that were connected. To the so they didn't dictate that they oh we want to know the JS app that was all up to you. I. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't, I can't remember if that was dictated or not, um, but. Um, you just figured this would be a good application for now. Yeah, exactly, yeah. You didn't need to do any like profiling or kind of once it broke, um, figure out where in the hot spots of the software was? Yeah, yeah, I mean, there, so it wasn't just like, it wasn't just like everything's fine in the wall. And you can read a little bit more about that. Like, like I talked about with uh, the heartbeats and seeing like that, that was a case where profiling was important where I had to see like, uh, yeah, like regular problems. So, yeah, uh, check out the article. Right, cool, thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. Yeah, cool.